All right, terrific. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Garavich, and uh, I chair the Department of Population Health at NYU uh, Medical School, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, today with all of you. Uh, and I wanted, again, just uh, uh, to follow suit of uh, others uh, who have acknowledged the uh, colleagues uh, who have helped organize this conference, of course, uh, Drs. Buford and uh, Xi from, uh, from here, from the New York Academy of Medicine, uh, Jim Nickman, and also uh, Jacqueline martinez Garcel, who played a, uh, an important role in, uh, from uh, the New York State Health Foundation and uh, colleagues at NYU as well. Uh, so this afternoon, uh, I think, is going to be the beginning of a thunderous uh, 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 second half of, of the meeting today. Um, we are, uh, it's really been very stimulating, uh, the speakers that we've heard from so far. Uh, in terms of the structure, the morning's panel um, really dealt with uh, the, uh, from a health systems perspective, uh, thinking about population health, and the afternoon's panel um, here is uh, thinking about uh, analogous issues from the framework of primary care. So I think to, to take a step back from our theme today, you know, there's a very great short story by uh, Raymond Carver, what we talk about when we talk about love. Uh, if you haven't read this short story, I uh, very much uh, commend it to you. And it's actually been uh, uh, riffed upon by uh, a guy called Nathan Englander who wrote a uh, short story, What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank. So this afternoon, if you want to redux our uh, panel, I think, is what we talk about when we talk about population health uh, from a primary care perspective. And, and I think we're very fortunate to uh, have three uh, uh, very uh, excellent and uh, presenters really representing various uh, perspectives. And so their bios are in your uh, materials, as you know, but uh, very briefly we're going to hear an order uh, from Neil Kalman, who's president and CEO of the Institute for Family Health and chair of family medicine uh, and community health at Mount Sinai. Then from uh, uh, John Ruggie, who's CEO of the Hudson Headwaters Health Network. And finally, from uh, Stacy Lindau, who's associate professor at the University of Chicago and founder and C chief information officer of the of NowPow. So, without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Neil Kalman, Dr. Kalman. Thank you, Mark. Um, and, and thanks for your leadership in this area, and also, I, I think, for putting together um, this amazing conference. I was blown away when I walked in the door this morning to see all the name tags. It's just, uh, it, it, it speaks to where we're at right now, and, and hopefully I'll bring a little clarity in a few minutes um, to some of the things that have sort of been um, on my mind. But first of all, let me just say that um, when, when I first heard the term population health, it wasn't from a public health person. It was actually sitting in a room with somebody in a health plan. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. A health plan person finally gets it that we really have to be talking about the health of populations in the community if we're going to really do something important to reach the health, health outcomes that we've all been trying to achieve. Then I realized they really weren't talking about population health. They were talking about enrollee health. And what I, and, and, um, and I hate that. So what I ask you to do from now on, whenever you're talking to a health plan person who starts talking about the work you're doing with population health, say, could we please call it enrollee health, unless we're really talking about the health of populations. But then I realized we're kind of guilty of that too in our own practices, because we talk about population health, but what we really mean are the people who come and visit our practices and the people in our individual practices. So. I think we should start talking about that as panel health. And so I want to start us by thinking about one of the most important things we could actually do is define our terminology. And let's really reserve the term population health for talking about populations, the kind of which you heard, the kind of work which we heard before, because I think that's going to be absolutely critical. And let's make sure that when we talk about health plans that we're talking about enrollee health or attributee health, and that when we're talking about the people in our practices that we're talking about panel health. So what do we really mean when we, when we talk about um, 
population health. And I, I think what it really, there, there's really been ex incredible examples of this this morning. But for me, what it means from a health provider point of view is that we're actually taking some responsibility for the people who are outside of our walls, people who don't actually come and even see us uh, as patients, and what kind of work that sort of brings us to do. What happens when we mix this up is we end up in some really weird places. So last week there was a conference um, in the Bronx of community health activists called Not Number 62. Some of you may have heard about this. Number 62 meaning because the Bronx, which you just saw this beautiful video of, ranks 62 out of 62 in terms of the health of counties in New York State. So you end up with a Cranes article like the one that sort of ran last week that lauded the Bronx for its high rates of preventive health care. And when you looked at the details, it was immunization rates and the number of adolescent women who had H, uh, HPV vaccine. But yet the last sentence said, but yet the Bronx residents are twice as likely to die prematurely as everybody else. So if there's ever a, a way of sort of driving home the message that we need to do more than what we can do in our offices, it's that there's stuff that has to be done outside of our offices. And you know, as providers, we're getting to do, we're getting really a lot better at doing um, our piece of panel health because there's financial incentives put in place now, right? So there's pay for performance, which is now, you know, runs everything from capitation to uh, shared savings models that are driving us to really focus on the kind of care that we give within our own centers and within our own practices. But it's not really focused on holding us accountable in any way for sort of the larger populations that live in the community. So what role do we really play as primary care providers, as community providers in this? And, and it goes even beyond social determinants. So I'll just tell you a little bit of my own history with this. So 20 years ago, I had what I call my professional midlife crisis. I won't talk about my personal midlife crisis. But the professional midlife crisis was sitting in my office one day looking at a chart of statistics in the, in, in the Bronx, um, of health statistics. And this was after building four community health centers in partnership with community-based organizations, starting two new residency programs and training family doctors out there. And I thought, wow, we're really doing great. And the health statistics were flatlined. They just weren't going anywhere. And I thought, is this really what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna spend my life in this kind of like micro environment that I've created, feeling incredibly successful at building and doing and making things happen, but not really being able to influence anything that could happen at a community level. And along comes the CDC um, in the late 1990s that wakes up and says, you know what, um, the Center for Disease Control needs to start thinking about population health and chronic disease and other things like that, because communicable diseases you know, well, we kind of have our, our handle on that a little bit, let's start thinking about this. And they put out um, an RFP that basically invited communities, invited health providers in partnership with community-based organizations to really look at, at population health. And we started something called Bronx Health Reach, which is, exists still today, is a partnership of over 60 community-based organizations. And that partnership has been able to achieve some amazing things, but what they do, and almost, um, and almost embarrassingly, really to the side, even though it's still part of our Institute for Family Health, almost to the side of what we do within our health centers is to spend all of their time out in the community doing community-based health promotion, which means doing things like you know, running forums that, that, that show how little the, the, the schools, the public schools abide by physical education rules and holding people accountable by working as part of a coalition with, with the Montefiore School Health Program and the Bronx District Health Office and others 
to basically get the entire New York City school system started. This, this effort started in one school in the Bronx. The entire New York City school system converted over to low-fat milk and eliminating sweetened milk in cafeterias. Things like that when organizations come together, but with the voices of health providers, people at Montefiore, people at the Institute, people in other community-based organizations, crying about how important it is that we kind of make these changes at a community level. When we started to go out into the churches, there's some unforgettable experiences, and one that I'll never forget is walking into a church in the Bronx and noticing that in the back row where we walked in, there were just bolts on the floors from where they had taken out an entire line of pews. And when I got to speak about diabetes that day and, and asked about what had happened, they had taken out the entire back row of pews to make room for amputees in wheelchairs. The entire back row of the church was filled with people in wheelchairs who were amputees from diabetes. And to reflect on the fact that in tw at that point, when I had been in practice for 20 years, I had never had a diabetic patient go for an amputee. Something that's really completely preventable. And here we were sort of recognizing that what we were doing within our own organization really wasn't going to get us there. So what do we do as healthcare providers? There's real power in these partnerships. I think that we need to actually have our voices heard. Let me talk a little bit about, um, just to end, about, about the, the impact of ACOs and disrupts. So people have said, you know, this is going to be a sort of a major boost, a major infusion of energy into population health. And I think it's got that potential, but I don't see that potential playing out. I think what we're dealing with in the district programs is enrollee health. In the districts, it's attributee health. It's starting to figure out who's in and who's out and working with the people that are already in these systems getting care. Yes, we have to outreach to people who might be on some list that who haven't come in yet, but the community itself, thinking about working in geographic communities. What the district program seems to be evolving into is a program where what we're going to be doing is referring and partnering with community-based organizations who do work, who do work on things that we can't really do, and housing and, and food security and other things like that. And that's, a fan, that's fantastic. It's definitely a step up from where we've been. But it's not about population health. Why? Because as we refer people to these resources, we're doing exactly the same thing we did 10 years ago. We're referring people with no housing to people who can help them get housing, except there isn't enough housing. And we're referring people who have food insecurity to people who can help them, but the benefits just aren't there to feed a full family anymore. And so the last thing I just want to say is population health has to grow to be about advocacy. It has to be about healthcare providers using the power of their credentials, the power of their organizations, the power of the fact that they're huge employers to be able to drive the kind of change you heard um, this morning when you heard talk about Kaiser and being able to go to Washington and go and be able to, to voice something about the way the, health, the way the system has to change. We have to be advocates. So just to, to, to summarize what I'm saying, watch, let's, let's change our language so that we're really clear. So when we're really doing population health, we know it and we stop pretending about other stuff that we can absolutely influence health in our communities by working in the community and partnering with other community-based organizations. But thirdly, that those partnerships have to become partnerships about advocacy that help build community resources. They can't just be about using the same inadequate resources that we've had all along. We can build better referral systems, but if there's nothing on the other side of that, if there's no increase in the kind of things that we need done on the community, we will just be frustrating ourselves and our patients. So thank you, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of my panelists.